Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Jewelry Makers Guild live podcast, where we dive deep into the driving creative forces of our fellow jewelers. I'm Tanya Davidson and the creator of the Jewelry Makers Guild and a fellow maker of 24 years. It's my quest to learn as much as I can, to try as many techniques and materials, and to share that information with other artists. So I thought it would be fun to do a visual podcast where we find out what inspires our fellow artists and makes their work so amazing. So please help me welcome to my podcast, Paulette Werger. Hi, Paulette. Hi, everybody. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> I don't think we're ready. Nobody's ready. I'm not. No, I'm not ready, but it's here whether we like it or not. <laughs> that seems like the, the theme of the year. It's never prepared. It's here. You just deal with it. Take one day at a time. So Paulette Werger is a studio jeweler and educator living in New Hampshire. She received her BS in painting and sculpture from the College of St. Rose at Skidmore College, New York. She also got her MFA in art medal from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Werger is a founding me me member of the Metal People East. I knew I was going to mess that up. That's a mouthful. In Lebanon, New Hampshire, where she now works. She exhibits nationally and internationally, has metalwork included in permanent collections, and teaches jewelry making and metalsmithing techniques. Her work was re re featured recently in Schiffer Publications, Mastering Contemporary Jewelry, and Lark Books, Showcase 500 Art Necklaces. I have both of those. And was honored as the 2012 Niche Award. She was also the New Hampshire Magazine Remarkable Woman of Craft in 2012. Congratulations. She has served as faculty at University of Wisconsin-Madison and Montana State University and is currently a trustee for the Society of Arts and Crafts in Boston, Massachusetts. Glad to have you with us today, Paulette. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, as we talk, Paulette, I'm going to be showing slides of your work. So if you'd like to add anything, just interrupt me um, and tell us a little something about those pieces or how they were inspired as we go through. Um, and I kind of sprinkled them in when I, as I ask you questions so they may or may not go with the question, but um, feel free to jump in with anything you want to um, add. So thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it, especially during the holidays. Everybody's so busy. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here. It's um, a great way to spend an evening with you. Thanks. I haven't seen you for like a year and a half. Yeah. No, last year, Tucson, I saw you very yes. briefly, but um, it's nice to have that sort of community connection with you and with the people that support the Jewelry Makers Guild because that's where you exist and I lurk and watch what you're doing you know, through the guild and the advice that you give and what you're doing. So I'm really honored to be here and thank you very much for including me. Thank you, that's very nice of you. Um, and, and most people probably don't know, but you were one of my mentors and I've taken your classes um, and I, I just learned so much from all of the little tidbits that I use every day that you shared with us. So I really appreciate that. Um, I've taken so many classes and workshops. Um, I hate to admit it, but over probably over 160 now. And um, all of those teachers have become uh, part of what I do. So I have incorporated all of those things and synthesized them. And it's funny because when I took your class, I already was teaching Kumbu and I already did bimetal and all of those things. But you can always learn from someone else how they do it or a technique or tidbit that they know or have done. And I figure if I can take two minutes off of the process, it's worth every penny to take a class to learn from somebody. So thank you, because I learned new techniques that I never knew about or had not tried and got, and got more comfortable with those. So it was a great experience. And that's, I wanted to make sure I could share your work with all the members because I made lists of all the people that I really love their work and I, and they're, the people are so wonderful and um, good human beings to share what they've done and how they've gotten to the place that they're in. So let's dive in. I'll, I'm going to ask you some questions and we'll explore your work a little bit more. So for most of us, there was a spark that led us down the path of creating. So I'm curious, what can you share with us one of your earliest memories of making art or making jewelry? Two things that come to mind immediately. B 
being of tomboy in my going to Sunday dinner at my grandmother's house and being totally bored with all the adult conversations and sneaking out the back door to my grandmother's back lot where there was a gravel pit. And my sister was always dressed in her dresses and I always had pedal pushers and kids and a kind of a t-shirt that probably had like schmutz on it. And I'd like sneak out the back door and I'd crack rocks open with another rock in the gravel pit. And then I would like bring those home and, and try and figure out like, you know, cause you, in those days there was no internet. So you had like Encyclopedia Britannica. Right. So you'd have to like figure out like, is this quartz? Is this granite? Is this like, what is this? And then I would try with telephone wire to make pieces of jewelry for my mom to wear to her office. So those, that's like a really vivid memory. And then at the age of nine, um, my dad gave me, he used to take me hunting and fishing. I was like his own Paul at, I was his only son. So um, he gave me a pair of pliers which then totally like rocked my world because not only could I just like bend stuff with my fingers, but I could like bend it with a tool. So that that's when I decided that there was some type of resonance with metal, mm -hmm. but I was always seen as arty. So I also like drew horses, you know, on my belly on the floor of my bedroom with a magic marker that would soak through the paper and get on the linoleum. <laughs> and then my mother would yell at me, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I had, the good graces of being blessed with parents that indulged me and that they didn't see art as um, other or making mm -hmm. as other. Yeah. And um, the thing that was wonderful is that my great grandfather was a Hudson River School painter and he raised, well, he gave birth, his family was 11, but he raised to you know, fruition, eight children wow. on his painting career. Wow. So as a result of that, um, an artistic endeavor as a career was not seen as being like, oh, you didn't go, you flunked out of med school, so you're going to be an artist, you know, or, right. or whatever the, the other, uh, the not so good less than stereotype of what an artist is. Yeah. So I, I feel like I've been fortunate because I had these two parents that indulged me with all of my weird oddities of <laughs> equipment. But at the same time, they encouraged me both to like, to keep making and drawing and painting and doing whatever I wanted artistically. And I think that was, that's really the point. Um, I, I have these very vivid memories from between eight and nine years of age that said, I love animals and I love making things. And those were the, those are still the two sort of pivot points that I have for myself, which is nice. It's good. Sounds like we're two peas in a pod. I was the boy too that my yeah. dad didn't have and animals and art was everything for me. But, um, yeah. and you know, both, both blue collar workers, my parents. So yep. they, and it, it was never less than, you know, whatever you wanted to do was perfect. That's what you were supposed to do. Yeah, and the conversation is dinner at dinner would be like when I was getting ready to go to college, it would be do what you want, but make sure that you do what you love. And so I think I took that very seriously. I wanted to excel in that, but at the same time, I I also felt the need to share that information with other people. So my education in at St. Rose and Skidmore were both for um, art education and studio art. Mm -hmm. So there was there were sort of two components like mm -hmm. how do you um, how do you take in what you want to do and who you are as a maker but at the same time how do you share that with somebody else. So it, it, it's it's a lovely thing. Yeah it's a good combination. <laughs> So I always think of a person's work as um, a perfect stew or a perfect quilt where all the squares don't match of the fabric, but they go together and they become part of who you are. 
just like all those teachers that I've had and all the experiences that I've had become part of my work and the heritage that I have becomes part of my work and those stories. So what would be um, part, who or what would be part of the ingredients that comprise of your work, uh, your perfect stew or your perfect quilt? Is it a certain person or is it a place? I think it's, it's a combination of a few things and the ingredients have to do with uh, the support of my family, um, who my teachers have been like Fred Fenster and Eleanor mm -hmm. Modi, mm -hmm. for example. Um, the people I've bumped into along the way who shared really potent information. Um, Susan Kingsley for one would be somebody who's made an indelible mark. Um, and then s what I look at, who, um, what resonates with me, which is usually like the, the images that you have up on the screen right now are based on drawings that I make that are paired. I collect botanical drawings and I've traveled a lot. So I have, um, things from like the 17th and 18th century that are etchings. Mm. And then I take, I extrapolate images from those things then do drawing and drawing and drawing. And I, I my work gets, gets very kind of pared down. Mm -hmm. So it's my practice as a studio jeweler, plus all of the people and places that have influenced me, the places I've been allowed to teach like Haystack and, you know, um, Aeromont and Appalachian Center for Craft, like the folks I meet in those places that may not be metalsmiths have influenced me amazingly. Yeah. Potters, all of my best friends are potters, for example, and they think completely differently than I do. Uh -huh. But there's something about how they make volume and form and how they deal with surface that has also integrated into me. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it's a big it stew. No, it does. It is a big yeah. stew. Yeah, those are some great highlights. And, and um, I, I can totally resonate with that. Cause I, when I would go to Aramon, I'd spend time down in the potter's rooms and watch them throw their pots. And it was very interesting to see all the different mediums. You go across the hall from the metalworking studio and there's the fabric studio where they're dyeing silk and all sorts of things. And right. it's just a really great experience to expose yourself to both travel and classes and meeting other people outside of your box. And mm -hmm. those become sometimes that pushes your work into a place that you would never have gone had you not just taken a day and done something different with your brain that you're not normally doing. I think what guides me mostly is probably curiosity of how things work and whether it's a glass artist or a blacksmith or a fabric artist or a basket maker i'm like well how did you do that and mm -hmm. what is your process because metal smithing is so much about process that you have this idea on one hand but then you have to do the myriad steps in order to get to the completion of an idea mm -hmm. yeah and so I always start with the idea first and it never quite crack the reality never quite cracks up to the what the idea was <laughs> it's like you've dreamt it or something and then you keep trying to make it better and better and better and better so that eventually you get to the stair steps of like well yeah that's sort of that's sort of the idea that I had you know <laughs> yeah I don't know if that makes any sense but no it does and it I think it's supposed to be whatever it's, it ends up being. You know, I sort of let go and say surrender to whatever it is happening and let it work itself out. And, and that sometimes is better than the result that I was trying to push. And when sometimes when you try to push something, it just never comes around. It, it, it doesn't come, it doesn't manifest in a way that you thought it would. And this is so much better when you're just willing to let it tell you what it wants to be or what you're missing in the process. So that is a really good segue into my next question about um, sometimes people are, you know, they're driven by something to create art. Some of them, it's because they want to communicate something. Some people just want to express a story. Some want to leave a mark. And um, so I'm wondering, what are you trying to communicate through your art? How I see things. 
um, ha and and um, I have the good fortune of being married to a scientist who does um, microbiology. So I, I I see, oftentimes I will go to his um, conferences and sit in the audience, and I have no idea what they're talking about, <laughs> but the slides are amazing because they're these like. <laughs> microscopic views of the world and then I go from macro to micro back and forth so I'm usually observing something that has to do with the natural world whether it's on a cellular level or a sidewalk scattering like the pair of salad servers that are up on the screen right now those handles are basically from walks that I have with the dog the inlay and the and the forming and the fusion is what I've learned, you know, from understanding how to use Argentium. But the, the design concept usually has to do with looking down at something and then saying, oh, my God, that would make a great brooch or, oh, my God, that would be. So I'm like always out there with my camera click, click, clicking away and then, you know, tire tracks in the wintertime to who knows what. And then sometimes I go back and I look at those things, they turn into drawings or pieces of jewelry or spoons or, you know, who knows what. I love, yeah, so. I love that you said that about, you know, taking pictures, whether it's with your actual camera or your mind's eye and um, being so present all the time. Like you said about the tire tracks, it's like, there's so much beauty in everything around us, but we're so busy and, often blind to the beauty around us and just taking a moment to see the small little stamen or the whatever can lead you down a path of of creating something even more beautiful than just trying to make something pretty i try very hard on a daily basis because there is so much ick in the world to spend at least part of my day looking for those kinds of things because I think it's just emotionally and mentally really healthy to do. I think that's a and really so it is. Tip. It is actually like that's usually on the dog walk too. So <laughs> thank God for the dog. No kidding. So a lot of artists get attached to their work and they have a hard time parting with it. And for some of us, it's about the journey. Like I could care less after I finish a piece where it goes or what happens to it. Because for me, it's just the process of working something out or, or trying something that I hadn't tried before. Um, what's more of a drive for you and why? I'm more ditto with you. It's like I work in series for that very reason. It's usually I'll do like when I get a hot idea, it's usually 10 to 12 things per series if they're one of a mm. kind pieces mm -hmm. versus if I'm putting a piece in production. So um, and production means like very small, like under 50. So really, it's not production. It's just studio jewelry. But right. um, I I'm more interested in the idea of why I'm making or problem solving. How do I set the stone? How do I develop a texture? What am I trying to do with the um, idea of communication? I, yeah, so I want to see, my, my end goal is really to see it on someone else, mm. not to keep it. Yeah. There's a few that have gotten away that I regret um, having parted with, but I know the people well enough that if I need to visit it, I can. <laughs> so that so that's good, because like uh, my clients usually turn into really close friends so mm -hmm. it's okay like it goes to I feel like it's at that point when you have a really wonderful piece it go it's an adoption more than it is a sale yeah it goes to a good home so, that you can visit yeah. later and pet if you need to yeah, exactly. <laughs> your pieces hearken to give respectful attention to not only botanical forms but also intentionally spare forms and I love that you said this that it was the spare forms of first spring or the last winter, which are usually the two seasons or growth periods that we often don't see or don't want to look at. Because, of course, isn't it beautiful when the flower opens up or or what, you know, the leaf is fully bloomed and it's green. But what about the the part before and the part after, which is the parts of life that we also don't love, you know, the birth and the death. But we, we focus so much on the middle part 
but the two that you focus on is is a really beautiful part of that process and so I wanted to hear a little bit about the impetus of creating your designs and where you get your inspiration. I know you get it from botanical and microbiology, but what else, what is, what is it something that you, that really excites you? What sort of, bot what nature things excite you or where would you, like if you needed some inspiration because you were having a, a moment where you, the creativity wasn't flowing, where would you seek that out? Um, the structure of probably botany, botanical structure. And like, you know, a lot of folks use Carl Blossfeld as mm -hmm. sort of a, a sort of a benchmark of understanding what botanical structure is. And yes, he, I've, I own photogravures of his. So I live with his imagery every day, as well as, you know, the botanical imagery, but I'm really interested in stripping down form so that it's as minimal as possible, but still structurally sound and, and has the ability to be worn. And in many cases, most cases, it's kinetic. So if you spend a lot of time looking at how flowers move or um, trees or branches are mm -hmm. constructed, you can learn a lot about metal in terms of how, where, where your stress points are and, and where things can be put together more easily. Mm -hmm. So I sort of feel like um, I do look a lot at architectural blacksmithing as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the history, probably the history of like tin, tin smithing and, um, like how oil cans are made and how um, milk cans are made and that kind of stuff. So for vessels and for flatware, that's one thing, but for jewelry, like the piece that's on the screen, those are several layers of parts that are fused together. And when you wear the piece, they're loose enough that as you move, that seed pod moves. That's so neat. So it, and it makes a sound when you huh. move. So it's it's has the added benefit of noise as well as kinetics. And then it also feels really good because it sort of hits right here, mm -hmm. right at the clavicle. So neat. Yeah. I love that you said um, something. What, what I heard when you said it was editing, learning to edit a form or a design or a thing, a piece, you know, a botanical and seeing the parts of it. And I think that's what really makes you a good artist is when you're able to edit. And a lot of people feel like they have to do so much on a piece or it's gotta be, gotta have so many bells and whistles when really simplicity, even though this is not a simplistic piece, um, it speaks volumes. And the form yeah, of this I think, necklace is just absolutely beautiful also. I think more is more. And I'm I, my work goes through stages where I sort of, I pare it down and then it gets too minimal. And then I'm like, oh my God, I can't deal with just the line. I need to build it back up and then I get more Baroque and then I go back in the other direction. And it, it's this sort of dance that you do back and forth between um, the idea and the volume or the form that you're mm -hmm. trying. And then you also, because it's wearable, you have to consider where is the viewing space how does it feel when it's on? Because what I love about jewelry is that there's this wonderful tactile sensibility. It's not like you're just wearing the the the, the billboard of what I've made. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm interested in how does it feel when it's on? What's that sensual um, feeling when you're wearing that V-neck back front black dress and you put that neck piece on? It yes. feels really good. Like if it's comfortable, you don't know you have it on. Well, it also gives you confidence and attitude and makes you feel pretty. And, oh, well, yeah, there's, and there's that too. So <laughs> the wearer not only has that tactile, but has the emotional that goes with it. And yeah. when your piece evokes that, that's a whole different playing field than just a pendant, you know, that is pretty. And, but there, that's But there's it. nothing wrong with pendants that are pretty too. But I, I just think that my personal kind of quirky way of looking at things is that 
I want the back and front of my work to be considered. Yep. I want it to feel good when it's on. And, and I want people to want to wear it. Mm -hmm. I want it to be kind of a go-to, like um, the women and men that support me with their jewelry, um, they, they have a certain sense of style or taste, but I can usually tell when things are horribly wrong or really well, just by the expression on their face when I see them look at the piece, you know, before they try it on. And then when they try it on, they gravitate towards the piece that their body needs, you know, mm -hmm. because that's the, the point of jewelry above and beyond the materials that it's made out of or the wealth that it projects is the, the, the physicality of wearing something. And I, um, that's a big deal. I don't know. Scale is a big deal for me. Yeah. And, um, I've had to learn to make my jewelry bigger and bolder because not everybody is the same size as me, mm -hmm. you know, yep. my business. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I love that turquoise. Oh, it's beautiful. So tell me, I, I know the answer to this, but tell me, um, what, what, what are your favorite techniques and what sets, sets you on fire, but not literally? <laughs> <laughs> I have literally been set on fire. Usually when I need a haircut and I'm looking down and this part goes into the fire, I know it's time because I smell my hair singeing. Um, probably um, Argentium has been a huge game changer in my practice because up to this point, the chains and the pieces that I would make would be predominantly soldered together with a seam that you can see and or a lot of cleanup. And um, that has changed because I don't have a lot of cleanup and I don't have a seam because it's fused together. Mm -hmm. And I'll do anything to solder like it's my or to fuse. It's my favorite. Fire is definitely something that I resonate with in a big way. Yeah, I love fire and fusing both. Um, this piece, it's funny because when I put this piece up for the preview of the call, the podcast call, um, I didn't have my glasses on and I picked this photo and then later realized that this was the back. And I thought, bravo, the back is as beautiful or more beautiful than the front. And that's how I think every piece of jewelry should be. I think about that. And, and some, some pieces, you know, you just want to, you want to wear them backwards. You should have the ability to wear something any way you want once you have it. Love it. Love it. So tell me a little bit about what's on your bench right now and if there's a story behind that. So... And you're probably not seeing the photo because um, you're 30 second delay, but it's the pieces um, of enamel that you're working on. I'm having, I'm, I've been pecking away because I've been spending um, a lot of years, you know, 30 years in the land of gray, black, and white with an accented gemstone, which is a specific shape. I've been pecking away at the use of color and I've, you know, experimented with polymer and I've done plastic inlay and resin inlay and, you know, stuff. And there's something about the authenticity of glass on metal mm -hmm. and the surface of glass on metal via enameling that I really uh, respond to, but I'm, but I'm not being at all precious about it. So the image that is in front of you are all all of these are torch fired everything is torch fired so there's like parts that peel back and things that burn and edges that aren't you know perfect and it matches how i draw and it matches how i think about color so there's there's parts where the enamels thinner thicker so um when i'm starting a new body of work i do a lot of experimentation and color testing or just testing in general like if it's chains for example i'll make several different styles of link and try my best so that pile right there are all the different tests that will some of which are abysmal failures and some <laughs> of which will be salvaged out of the pile and turn into something so the refreshing thing for me is that these pieces that are folded are um, 
they're, they represent volumes I'm interested in, but at the same time, the surfaces have colors I'm interested in. So the poppy pieces are also things I'm working on right now as well. I love torch fired enamels and how the oxidation on the edges and where it pops up in, you know, in those layers, it's just so yummy. It's, I don't know, there's something about it that is delicious. It's really pretty. And by etching the surface or stoning back the surface, you have that sort of same, the same velvety surface that you would get on um, just, I like a good matte finish. I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty. It's like that same sort of finish that you get on an actual poppy petal is also, mm -hmm. it reflects light still, but it isn't shiny. So right. I, I really appreciate that depth of color. It's nice. Well done. I like it. So now putting on a different hat, um, how do you manage all of your business tasks, your marketing and your packaging and shipping and teaching and sourcing and shipping out stuff with making, finding time to be creative and work on these collections? I jokingly say that my other business name is Seat of the Pants Productions <laughs> or Studio Ennui, depending upon like how tired I am or how bored I am with stuff. But um, it's a juggling act. And I think that because I, because I am a sole proprietor of a business mm -hmm. and because I'm the only one and I don't, I can't hand, I don't have studio assistance. I can't hand it off. I can't say go to the post office or could you finish this bezel or could you solder this ear wire on? I'm my people. Yeah. So, um, you know, yay me, <laughs> but on the, on the flip side, it can be kind of a pain in the neck because I would sometimes like to just say, could you take these 12 packages and throw them in the mail for me? And here are the slips and like download it. But no, I'm like, I'm my people. So yeah. Um, it's a, it's tr you have to be organized and you have to compartmentalize and um right now i'm doing uh since march be due to covid i've re i've kind of reprioritized for this year and i've spent more time with my teaching practice and less time with my marketing like my clients who know me i'm not putting stuff out there because I'm going to be redesigning my website in January. So I think it, um, making those decisions when you're an in independent sole proprietor can be huge because it affects your income. Yeah, you have to know. And like know, knowing like which direction to go in uh, and like how to stack the deck is can be difficult if you don't have um, another income from like a, you know, a tenure track teaching job or mm -hmm. whatever the other thing is that you do yeah. so it's um it it's it is it's a juggling act but and i screw up all the time but you know you just have to keep trying and yeah. keep doing it you have to learn when to pivot when when yeah. look, looking at the future looking at what's happening and say okay if if, if this continues great i'm going to do this but if this happens i'm going to pivot and do this and how can I have multiple streams of income coming in from maybe teaching and making and whatever other thing you do, selling tools or whatever, so that you can, um, one can cover the other if there's a, a lack of sales in that area. When you talked about compartmentalizing, um, do you do something like where Monday is a day that you're doing business and or one day you're doing sketching and working on new or do you actually divide up your time that way or do you have a plan when you go to work every week or just wing it? That might be the idea when I get up on Monday morning, but <laughs> um, usually I have, uh, I live by the three by five or the, it's like the five by eight cards. card. Yes. The index and cards. like it's, it's in my phone or it's on my laptop, but I may, I'm like make the list of 10 things yeah. and and every day I do the 10 things. And if I can get to the 10 things and I can check them all off, then I've had a good day and that's okay. That's a great day. Yeah. But um, I think since March, it's been more like five things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's good if we can get to the five just, things. 
<laughs> right. And everything just takes twice as long because like the post office takes twice as long and the return phone call takes twice as long and the, yeah. you know, it's just like everything takes twice as long. So I'm okay with five things. Yeah. I kind of want 10 things, but hey, you know, it's okay. You've learned to establish your expectations, which is really good. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like you just have to roll with it and hopefully, you know, not get your undies in a twist about it. That's so. true. <laughs> so do you enjoy selling your work? And if and what methods do you, you prefer for selling? What do you think works well? How what do you look forward to? Is Do you like doing in person? Do you do a lot of online? I I love selling in person and I love meeting the people that are curious about my work and end up becoming clients. Mm. However, that game has changed. Yes. And now I'm learning what all that other stuff is about. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like in some ways I'm, um, I'm on a, um, I've had the advantage of being successful at the in-person scenario. So I haven't really had to think about the online scenario. And now I'm reevaluating all that, which is also really good for me because it means that I get to meet new people, but, and it creates new brain folds. And, you know, maybe by the end of it, I'll be either smarter or more tired. I don't know, <laughs> but um, it's, um, it's going to be a challenge because I don't, I'm a one of a kind jeweler. So it's been very difficult for me to think about, well, how do I show mm -hmm. the subtlety of the work I make? And um, it's not like I'm going to find like the two pieces of amber, that's Mexican amber. And I'm not going to find 20 pieces of that. Right. I mean, that that's it. And so figuring out how to have that conversation when there's a a barrier there. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. I'm figuring all that stuff out and it's a to be continued. Um, production, I understand. And I've made all sorts of production work in the past, but I'm not entirely sure that's where my toes are pointed because I love unusual materials and one of a kind things and the processes mm -hmm. of those things. So I'm still puzzling all that stuff out. Yeah. I'm going to learn a lot in yeah. 2021, I think. <laughs> I think that's going to be the theme for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that's just where we all are. Yes. Um, and I know you love to teach. And as I've said, I've been in your classes. Um, so what, what, how often do you teach? And what kinds of techniques do you cover that other people aren't, haven't, don't know about you? Um, I've been teaching for years and years. And thanks to my education at University of Wisconsin, I've learned how to teach well. And um, I currently, this since June, I've been learning to teach online, which has been really, virtual teaching has been really fun. And like, I didn't, like, I was one of those grumpy people that was like, I don't know, and rah, rah, rah. And then suddenly I was like, okay, I'm buying the video camera. I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure this out. And I'm having a ball and it's fun. It's yeah. really fun. And I've taught, um, I want to say six or seven classes since June. Wow. Um, and what I just, I just scheduled another six or seven with metal works, mm -hmm. um, um, that will go through May. Um, and what kind of what techniques I, are you teaching? Uh, I'm teaching some cold connection, um, making chains that don't require heat, making chains that have a little bit of heat. Um, I'm thinking about my first inclination when we were in lockdown was to say, I had to move out of this studio. So you can see from behind me that there's like a lot of stuff back there. And the build, my, the building I'm in got shut down. So as a result of that, I was like, oh, geez, what am I going to do? Like, I need to make stuff. So I carted under cover of night, I went and got my bench and my torch. And, and I thought, well, I can't be the only one. So my answer to the teaching was, what can you do simply from your home that's safe and doesn't require ventilation? Mm -hmm. So I did a, a cold connected chain class and a cold connected earring class. But for people who are just starting or are curious about jewelry, it's a perfect place to begin. 
-hmm. And then you start to sort of build out accordingly. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I've been sort of working on that. And, and then during this time, there's been a lot of um, online discussions about how to teach online and curriculum development mm -hmm. and um, how to best reach audiences that have supported you or new audiences. So I've been involved in a lot of those discussions and I've really learned a lot and take this community very seriously and want to broadcast seeds so that people can have a potent experience even if they're estranged from their tools and equipment. Mm -hmm. So that is sort of the long answer to the short question, but sorry. No, no, that was good. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed, I was part of that group too. And that those were good conversations yeah. about teaching and, and what to yeah, what and to expect for other, what, how, to, how to plan so they get the most out of the class as well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing our, some Argentium fusion classes to answer your question, some stone setting classes, some unusual stone settings, sort of like what's in the picture right now. There's, I'm framing, like those are framed beads, but they have tabs so that they don't, they look like a cabochon that's been set, but there's a hole through it. Mm -hmm. And then the piece of rutilated quartz is actually um, a faceted, it's a buff top, faceted back stone so learning how to like how do you deal with there's so much variety in the gem business right now because mm -hmm. there's been so many innovations in cutting and also in materials that our job as designers and jewelries is to figure out how, how do you how do you trap those things yeah. and, and and like what do you like you go ooh ah and you buy it and then it sits in your vault or on your bench <laughs> and makes you feel guilty for like six months until you figure out what to do with it. So right. I figure I can't be the only one that's going through this. Mm. So my classes for unusual settings, for example, are what do you do with this thing? Like it could be driveway gravel or it could be <laughs> uh, a, you know, a diamond slice. I don't know. Right. You know, so you could like have the whole spectrum of things. That's cool. And this is through Metalworks, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is one of my favorite places to take classes. I have been there a lot. Um, I used to go for two to three weeks every summer, but I haven't been back for a couple of summers. This one, mostly because of COVID and last year. But it's a great place to take classes. And they always do a really great job of their classes. And I, I haven't seen the online ones. I did the summit. Um, that they had, or I don't know what they called it, but the, it was like four days long or five days long. That was really good. I think you and I had, and I had talked about that, but um, they do a great job and that's a great place for people to find classes. And I hope they'll look up your classes. I'm going to, at the end of this podcast, put in all the links um, in the comment section. So if people want to check that out, they can. So there's a sort of a shout out that I want to give to the nonprofit organizations that have had to pivot. Like we talk mm -hmm. about our own individual lives and how it affects us as makers or how it affects, you know, can I pay my property taxes or my mortgage or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. our nut is that we have to crack. But there's a whole lot of folks that are managing or working in positions to promote our careers mm -hmm. that are also having to pivot. So mm -hmm. it's like places like Society of Arts and Crafts or Metalworks or Pocosin or, you yeah. know, Arizona Designer Craftsmen, Florida Society of Goldsmiths. All of those places are also where you can get information, but they too are pivoting and they're trying to figure out, well, how do we keep our community together right. and support them? It's so the Jewelry Makers Guild is like what you're doing is really important because that sort of ties all of you talk about the patchwork quilt ties a lot of that together so you're providing a clearinghouse for some of that information which is really good thank you yes that's my goal yeah good yeah and we all if <laughs> we all going. if we all work together we can help each other out especially um making sure people know what opportunities there are and where they can find those opportunities which is why i like to talk to these artists because you always learn something about process you learn something about technique but more importantly you also get connected to somebody new and then that takes you on another adventure that uh, will inevitably make your life better and especially your work better so i love that part of it so tell me 
what does your perfect studio day look like? And I know you don't have an assistant. I was going to ask you that, but you have a, <laughs> you have a little assistant that you take on walks. What's right there? What's his name? Is a girl or boy? It's a boy. What's his and name? His name is Z. His name is Z. Just the letter. But I call him Punk because he's a punk. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he has a bit of attitude. He's got a total attitude, and he, like he'll look at you and you'll say, "Come here," and he'll okay, be like, "Yeah, I don't no. think so." <laughs> it's, it's funny how these gems get brought into our life for some purpose, yeah. which is to challenge us or to make us laugh or just not sweat the small things. But you're... he has a very good sense of humor. Your studio is beautiful. So is this where is this the place that you work? The um, oh my gosh, metals. East people, no, I said that wrong. Metal People East is the Metal name of the East. studio, but it's in a, um, what you're looking at right now is actually the floor, the cutting floor of um, a denim overall company. Wow. This, this building, all the windows are there because of when the building was built, there was no electricity. So natural light was a big deal. And, um, the building is a historic building that's been, was left fallow during the 70s and 80s. And it was originally owned by the Carter family of the Carter overall fame huh. that has since moved to North Carolina. But this is where overall, denim overalls used to be made. You can see that black line that's on the floor. Mm -hmm. That bolts of fabric would be laid out against that line to be straight, huh. uh, one on top of another. And then things would be cut with basically like a, kind of like a scroll saw down into fabric against a wooden pattern. Wow. And this is a three-story building. It's 40,000 square feet in size. Wow. And it's been turned into an art center in our tiny town of Lebanon. So I have the good fortune of having this lovely corner studio on the top floor that has lots of north light. It's beautiful. And you can see my bench right there is where, where I'm sitting, but you're looking out the window behind me. Mm-hmm. And then I have ventilation that my friend Jim helped me build from Habitat for Humanity. So it's properly vented. And I have a teaching area, which is that big flat layout table. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a great space to work in. And there's plenty of space to like spread out. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. And I have the good fortune of Ava Gallery and Art Center is where this is located. And the entire mission of the organization, there's 18 artist studios in this building, as well as three professional studios for people to take classes in and galleries. It's wonderful. So it's like this whole, like, there's a whole community at my disposal if I want to open my door to it. But most of the time I'm in here with my nose to the grindstone. So <laughs> That's really you know. nice. Lovely. Lovely it's a space wonderful, too. It's a wonderful place to work. And being on the third floor, you can look out the window and all you see is are the hills, mm -hmm. which is nice. So, Not mountains, but just hills. <laughs> so is there something that you do every day to, to prepare yourself for a creative day? Do you have any rituals or processes? Some people do. A lot of people don't, or maybe they're not aware of their processes, but usually there's something that gets you ready for the day, whether it's put your apron on, take your dog for a walk, whatever. <laughs> I have coffee in bed. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't have coffee, I would not have, I would not be able to do anything because I would be brain dead. So yes, Eric brings me coffee and I have coffee quietly. And then I sort of puzzle out what I'm supposed to do that day. <laughs> so yeah, coffee. That works for me. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't do, nobody talks to me until I've had coffee. That's for sure. Yeah, me either. Okay. So now let's do, I, my favorite part <laughs> is when, since I was a jewelry tool and supply company owner and I love, love, love tools. I don't know what it is about a new tool. It's like Christmas every day. And I feel like I have to have them all. So I love this part where I ask everybody what their top 10 tools are because everybody's has been completely different, which is interesting to me as well. But um, we do it all, all David Letterman style. So we start with number 10. So your top, your number 10 favorite tool is your enameling kiln. And um, that one is, that Paragon makes a great kiln. That one is rebranded to Rio. But um, I love that. That's a good kiln. And it's funny because 
<clears throat> it's uh, it's number 10 on the list because up to this point, I've been doing mostly torch firing and now I'm re-examining, well, what are the differences between torch firing? Like the dirt that you get torch firing and the clean surface that you get when you put something in a kiln. So are you doing so, mostly yeah. opaque enamels or are you working now with um, transparent since you have the kiln? Uh, mostly it's just opaques right now and then soon it will be transparent. I know that a couple of the members had some questions for you about the enameling. I, like an idiot, don't remember what those questions were. So maybe they'll post them in the comments and you can answer them if oh, you sure. at will. I know that Kay had a couple of questions for you about the enameling. Oh, Kay. Yes, Kay. The Kay that I know? Yes, Kay Cummins. Hi, Kay. So <laughs> I'm sure she'll post them in there, but I'm sorry, Kay, I forgot what they were and I don't have my phone on, so I can't, I can't tell, I can't ask them. Um, tool number nine is your Orion Pulse Arc Welder. And I have. Why, yes, yes, I, it is. That's a, it's a really, do you have the new one? No, I have, a, I have an older one in my model. I forget what the model is. S100, maybe? I have the, I'm looking at. the puck. Yeah. And, um, you know, shout out to, I have to shout out to two people, three people. Sunstone. Yes. He Jeff Georgiantis, mm -hmm. yeah, Jeff Georgiantis, who has, was the one that taught me how to use it, as well as David Baird, and um, Otto Fry, where I purchased it. So I, part of the reason why this tool is important to me is I'm thinking too about as you age and you need bifocal, trifocal, whatever, you know, and you're, and you're body changes and your grip strength changes and your ability to see changes. When I first looked through the oculars on this, I was like, oh my God, I have the eyes of a 20 year old. <laughs> I want this, I want this tool. So one of the reasons I got this piece was because I thought, well, okay, this is, this is a piece that makes me more powerful as a maker so that I can still be making when I'm 90. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so that that's just, I mean, that was the impetus for why I chose to purchase the tool. I think any tool that m makes it so that your body can last longer is a really good investment, yeah. whether it's a health investment, like a vacuum or, or ventilation, or whether it's your planishing hammer behind you, which is one of my favorite tools that I can smash a piece of metal flat without having to get my hammer out and really oh, go yes. at it. Yeah. And it's no shoulder work, you know, it's just your hand yeah. and... Those, this is awesome. Yes, yeah. those tools are awesome. And um, you're re very fortunate to be it, near Boston so you can go take those classes at Metalworks that teach how to use the, the pulse arc welders. Um, I know that Sunstone is out of Utah, but it's not easy to find those classes. And David Baird is so um, sharing. And um, the other gentlemen yeah. that you said, they all are very. Yeah, and Jeff, I have the advantage of I live like adjacent to Hanover, New Hampshire, and Jeff is at Dartmouth College, and oh. he has he gave classes at Dartmouth, and it was just it was wonderful because I could test out different pieces of equipment mm -hmm. and see which one. Like he had all different types of pulse arc welders, not just an Orion. So I don't like you have a puck, so I tried that. But there was something about the oculars on this that fit my face better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. I don't, you know. They're all good tools. I mean, everybody's, just... everybody's got their own resonance with whatever tool. So don't listen to me. Just try it out for yourself, you know. And, and you're only as good as you know how to use the tool. This tool will not true. do it for you if you don't know how no. to use it. And Kay and I both have the puck and we talk often about using it because we're still don't feel like we know everything there is to know about oh it. god i i'm and still just learning how to yeah yeah it's yeah. it's great for jump rings <laughs> and ear earring posts yes yes <laughs> makes it super simple so your number eight is the peppy um ring bender i love that one too i have one in each of my studios um and they make the yeah. new little set have you seen the new set that goes have, with it, yes. um, the micro ones. So they're really nice for doing small bezels or, you know, different shapes, a V shape or, so yeah, it's a really good tool. Um, the Durston makes one also that's um, a nice. And this is another thing like I, I work with, when I teach, I work with lots of varied ages and abilities. 
and people with different hand strength. Mm -hmm. So this tool gives you the ability to bend something. Like I'm a big, just use a pair of pliers, use a half round pair of pliers, Mm because I have very strong hands. But again, this is a tool that if you don't have hand strength, you can still do a very heavy, thick ring shank Mm -hmm. with no marring and no marking on it. And it comes out like a dream. It's fast, it's easy. And the tool, like as long as you feed it in correctly, the tool just does the, does the job. And it's just, it's wonderful when, when you have somebody that does that kind of engineering so that, they, so that they're puzzling out what the problems might be for you. Mm-hmm. It's great. Yeah. David's a great guy too, the guy that owns uh, Pepe. I always want to say Pepe, but I have to like spell it out so I say it right. Your number seven is the Fretz HMR413 hammer, which is the pointed hammer um, yes, on each yes. end. I have a lot of their hammers, and I really like them. They feel so good in your hand. So what do you use this one mostly for? Mostly for texturing small areas and um, surface embellishment. And um, again, like the one, one of the things that I love about the community that we're in is that at any point in time, you can find the inventor mm-hmm. or the maker of the tool. And and you can like with Bill, for example, Bill Fretz, who's the maker of this product. Mm-hmm. If you have an idea for like, well, I want a texturing hammer with such and such a pattern on it. Like if he hears that same thing from like 50 people, he figures it out and, and he brings it to the marketplace. And it's like, what other field of interest has that direct line for being able to have invention and result? There's not a, there's not a whole lot of fields of interest that have that. So I, that's what I love about metalsmithing is that it's a big, deep, wide pool and everybody knows how to make things. So you get all these crazy inventions, you know, from, yeah. And we've cool. had some really cool tools come about in the last five years because of that. So, um, yeah, it's fun. And very good collaborations between, um, like, Michael Good and Bill Fretz. Is it like the, like, figuring the conversation between somebody who's an engineer and somebody who's a maker? Yes. And then you get, you distill that, you distill that conversation down and then poof, you end up with stakes and hammers and mm-hmm you know, tool holders and all this like wonderful stuff. Yeah. yeah and then your fortunate. eyes light up and you have to have it. You know? <laughs> yes. That's the one thing I don't have shoes or purses or anything, but I have a lot of tools. <laughs> yeah, me too. Is <laughs> we have our priorities straight. So your number six is the Durston um, 158 millimeter rolling mill. I would love to have this mill or an electric one, but I don't have it. Do you have this one specifically? Mine is actually, I don't know if it's a one, I think it might even be a 180. It it was the original Durston mill that was put into the marketplace when with um, John John Fry. And I wanted a big, big rolling mill because I was doing vessels that required oh, yeah. Patterned surfaces. I was doing a lot of roller embossing, so I wanted that big, wide, yeah. flat mill. And I talked seven other people into buying mills along with me, <laughs> <laughs> and it gave John the ability to have uh, the a, a year of option for marketing the Durston tools. Uh-huh. And so it's whatever the first one is, it was the first one that came off the boat from England. I don't know. I think it's, I'd have to measure it, but it has, it's close to that because I have nice. two, two different sizes of half round on the ends and then a big bunch of square things and then a flat. And it's a, it's a beautiful, with a reduction handle, so yeah. you can do really thick stuff on a tool stand with storage underneath. It's amazing. Yeah, that's a it's, nice. It, it is really a beautiful, like if you can get all squidgy about shiny surfaces and like the gear ratio of turning a handle. Oh my God, it's like the best thing since sliced bread. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm geeking out here. <laughs> I actually like that about you <laughs> so much. <laughs> I get all excited. No, turn the handle slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Most people can't really relate. They just think you're so weird. And but you know, I, know I am weird, but I'm I'm likable. <laughs> I'm just weird. Well, this next one was kind of an odd one for me because it's such a, a normal tool that you don't think about, which is the half round ring file um, zero cut, which can't live without, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I would have put it in my top 10, but I love that you triple did. Triple zero cut, triple zero cut. <laughs> oh, it's the a triple. The coarser, the better. Yeah. And, and um, the other file that I can't find anymore, and I don't even know, I'm looking in my bench here to see if I have it here. I don't, it's home. Is a, it's a bastard cut file single cut mm -hmm. and it's like a zero cut file and the and the cutting lines are on a diagonal so it's a machinist file of some kind i got it many years ago to at a snag conference and i've never been able to find another one so and i file mark a lot of my work so i'm always looking like i have a checkering file mm -hmm. and then i have a zero a double zero a triple zero and then this bastard cut single cut file it's sort of like almost like a like a farrier's file, mm -hmm. but not as coarse as that. It's sort of a couple shades to the left. And hand tools, the simpler the tools are, it's what you do with the tool that's really important. That's true. So I'm interested in developing a, a palette of <laughs> mark making. Mm -hmm. And this particular file just kind of totally just kind of trips my trigger, you know, so I don't know. And, you know, they don't make tools that, like files, especially like they used to, you know, they're not as good. So it's it when you find a new file, it's like, oh, it's not as good as my old file. I don't think they make things like they used to in this way, but I could be wrong. I, I also shop the second hand and flea market and the look under the counters for old hammers and mm -hmm. and and part of my my upbringing in the metals community with particularly with fred fenster is that part of my graduate school education was we would go to flea markets and we would have to find broken tools and fix them there was always a race to find the best planishing hammer or the best forging hammer or the best ball peen hammer and then you would have to learn how to resurface it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like uh, oftentimes I'm I'm not as interested in buying the shiny object because I know how to make or repair the shiny object. Right. So I, I, I sort of weigh and balance um, my need for a hammer like my texturing hammer is this right here, which is just a, it's an eight ounce ball peen, but I've gone in and, and patterned this surface. Mm -hmm. So this is a crap It's well, it's a night, it's a, it's a nice case hardened hammer, but it's kind of crappy hammer that I got at a, <laughs> you know, as opposed to a very shiny, beautiful, right. Planishing hammer, which you want to keep this way. Right. So it's just sort of, you have to kind of weigh and balance. What are you doing with it? How much do you need? And, how many tools does one girl need? It's like, how many pairs of shoes do you really need? You right. only have two feet. Right. right. Your I number four is your flesh cutting pliers from Auto Fry. Do you really like those? I really do. And I got to say, like, I have Lindstrom's. These mm -hmm. are as tough. And I originally purchased them to be my teaching pliers so that I could travel and keep my Lindstrom's at home. But now I just use these all the time because they cut really well and you can, it's, there's very little nib from, from it. You barely have to clean it up. And if you're doing riveting, they're perfect because they get in the hmm. tight I might spot. have to try that, a tool that I they're, don't have. <laughs> they're, they, I, I really think that they, that they're doing their homework in terms of providing tools that uh, may not be quality of steel in this is good and the cutting edge has lasted the I have two pair now I just got a new shiny pair but my other pair is like 
I want to say 15 years old and wow. the blade is still really sharp. So that's nice. That's a good tool. It's nice, it's nice when you get a, a good one. Yes. Your number three is your set of four pliers. And that's these, these are brand new. And I, they're, um, I have a thing for stainless steel or chrome <laughs> simple ply. I don't know. I just like the way they look. But the hand feel of the handle is really nice, and the tip sizes are nice. The half round is particularly tiny, and is I that, have the. I'm looking I for have, a five millimeter. Something that will fit in like a four or five millimeter. It it's it about that size, Ooh. and it's not like the ones that you find at Rio or the Contenti pair or the Guess Wine pair, which has a yellow handle. Yeah, I have much higher a dome, and this is right. a little bit. A dome. So Ooh, that reason there. I got that was for the half round flat. Nice. You never know when you're, I, I've been on the search for the smaller one and couldn't find it. And I actually asked somebody who works for a tool company. I'm like, I'm looking for this. Can you please try to find me this? Cause I, you know, you know, when you look in a catalog, they don't tell you what the tip size is at the end. So then you and, order and it. And particularly half round flats, the, yeah. the radius curve there is different on all of them. So I now have three different pairs of half round flats that are from three different companies that have three different arcs. And which is great because if you make a lot of rings, which I do, mm -hmm. or make a lot of links, which I do, right. then I can just, I know which radius curve I grab when I grab the plier and it's right. wonderful. The same so. thing with the uh, half round. Uh, files. They're never the same dome. So no, it's nice right. exactly. when you're looking for, you know, something to match your cab that you have to file down. It's nice to have a variety of those. So that yeah, you can and ring files are not, are not necessarily, they don't necessarily match the inside of the ring you're making. Great. So you have to have radius curves. Your number two um, is Argentium <gasps> Sterling or Whoa. Argentium Silver, not Sterling, but Argentium Silver. And um, you get that from Rio? Yes. I do. Yeah. I do. And um, it's total game changer in my studio. And so have you been using it since the very beginning when it came out? I have. I have. And so that was like 10 um, or 15 years ago, right? Longer. Yeah. And it, it was Lee Marshall, Cynthia Ide, and myself at the SNAG conference in Birmingham, England. And we actually met the man who was from the Worshipful House of Metals, who was perfecting the alloy. And he gave us each little samples mm -hmm. to try. And of course, we were like, this is really cool. How do we get more of this? You know, it was like, I need more right away. And then, then we managed to, like, like it, it sort of went to the United States and a bunch of us started using it. But um, it was initially sold as an antioxide metal, but mm -hmm. the part that resonated with me was the part for fusion. Fusing, yeah. It fuses yeah, beautifully. Oh my God, it's just amazing. Yeah, love so, yeah. it. It's a great, um, it's a great addition to the toolbox. And um, it is. Yeah, it frustrates some people because they don't, you know, there's when you have so much going on in your studio to have another metal to keep straight and to keep the rules with your newer and your, you don't realize you can't push it you can't manhandle it when it's hot you know that kind of thing but you just if you once you start working with it then it's it becomes addictive because it's actually easy to use compared to sterling. i think once you have the initial sort of like silver has its rules and gold has its rules and brass and bronze have their rules pewter has its rules once you understand what they are and you don't apply your silversmithing rules to the argentium then you're okay and you you begin to use it for its own material sake right. and, and then once you understand that then you become more powerful as a maker yeah i agree with that and your number one tool is the acetylene Whoa. smith handle <laughs> and tip storage which i have one right here i like it yeah it's just it's something i use every day it's I'll do anything so I can fuse or solder. And I think really the number one tool above the tool um, is your, your hands, your eyes, mm -hmm. and your imagination. I think really that 
like starting from you, what your idea is, and then having the hand-eye coordination to do all this stuff is really, that's the tool. All these other things just enable us to do that job better. Yes. But like, I love fire. So that had to be first on the list. <laughs> I admire that about you. <laughs> so I want to thank you again for your time, especially during these busy holiday season. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing your new website in January and seeing what you're Yay! creating in 2021 and your classes. Um, on the bottom of the screen, everybody should have noticed that it had your website and your Instagram and your Facebook, but I will again be posting all of the links in the comments section after this call concludes. Um, so you guys will want to check out her social media pages and follow and like her and also check out her classes at Metalworks. And um, as later down the road, when I post um, a did you miss this podcast, I will then um, put your new website. So that will be in January. Um, and Metalworks is really a great place to take high quality education with teachers that have been fully vetted and the studio is amazing. Lindsay is such a great um, director there. So it's really um, a, a great place to fly into. You can spend two or three days at the museums. Um, Boston is amazing. So I will post that all in the comments later. And in the meantime, um, you could take classes virtually yes. and um, that's that's one of the things that you know we can see each other and develop community and hope for days where we can actually hug hug each other right. <laughs> so yes the online classes they've been doing this for a while and um, you teach their on some of their online classes too so people don't have to wait until COVID is over with they can get on the internet and take it um and this is really nice because you're in your studio you're using your own tools you don't have to pack anything up and it it is great because you, you know where how you like to use your torch and you know how you like to use your bench and so that's one of the benefits of taking an online class and you can rewind and watch and repeat until you get it which i love because sometimes i daydream in class and i'm like what did she say I missed that part. Yeah. Oops, I missed it. Oops, missed it. Oh, the dog barked. Uh-oh, I had to get up and let the dog out. Yeah, that. So I also love for you all to follow and like my pages where I share techniques and tips and I film videos um, every day. Like yesterday, I filmed a video on how to make components. So I'll post those links as well. And I have three other groups that you might not know about, even if you're a member of the Jewelry Makers Guild. One is JMG Tools for Sale, which stands for Jewelry Makers Guild Tools for Sale, which is a place you can de-stash and pick up really great tools that other people are de-stashing, and that's on Facebook. And then I run another group called Tucson Gym Show Happenings, which is uh, important now because it got canceled as of yesterday um until april it's being delayed until april so there i will be posting all the latest information and news about the gym show and also did last year and help you connect to some um vendors that you maybe need to buy something from and you don't know what show they're at because they are combining a lot of shows and, and vendors are moving around so those are two groups you might want to join that i run and also on instagram i have a jewelry makers guild page where i share Lots of videos from other makers and their tips and techniques there as well. So thank you again for attending the Jewelry Makers Guild podcast. And thank you, Paulette, for coming and being my guest. My next um, podcast is January 6th, where I'll have Jan Harold, the amazing namelist, um, with us. So you'll want to catch that. That's going to be a good one. So thanks again. I hope you have a beautiful holiday. And I really do appreciate your time. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Jewelry Makers Guild members, and anybody else that's watching. My mom's not here, but, you know, <laughs> there might be somebody I know. I don't know. Well, but thank you so much for inviting me. I yes. really appreciate it. Hopefully in January, this will be on already. All of the podcasts will be on the YouTube channel and then also on uh, Apple iTunes, which won't have a visual, but at least you'll be able to listen to it in your studio. So we're progressing. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I hope you have a great evening and stay warm with those 18 inches coming down of snow. Uh, I know. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a good one. I'll catch you in January. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.